This video is related to an ongoing discussion on the CC Talk mailing list about recovering data from old digital DEC Tape 2 or TU58 tape cartridges. DEC released the TU58 tape drives around 1978, and they are used much like floppy drives with many PDP 11 and VAC systems. While they were a lot slower than floppy drives, they were cheaper and were very easy to interface to small computers over an ordinary asynchronous serial port. This is a TU58 cartridge. It stored 256 kilobytes using two tracks on 0.15 inch wide tape media, which is coincidentally the same width as ordinary audio cassette tape media. It consists of an aluminum base plate and a clear plastic cover, two tape reels, a spring loaded dust cover, a drive wheel which is accessible through a slot in the uh, top cover, a drive belt which wraps around the drive wheel, rubs against the tape on the reel, goes around a couple of idler wheels, back around the other reel and around the drive wheel again, and a sliding right protect tab up here. Here's an open cartridge with the drive belt replaced by this red band that shows up on camera better. So note that there's no provision for the take up and supply reels to be driven separately. Instead, this drive wheel here moves the red elastic belt which presses against the tape on each reel. This allows the transport to use a single motor rather than the multiple motors and or more complex belt systems in other high-speed tape transports. But the drive belts are unreliable, especially after 30 plus years of decay. They can lose their tension, break, or worst of all, they can stick to the tape surface such that they peel the oxide right off the tape when the tape is moved or you try to remove the remnants of a broken belt. Now this red belt isn't original. This is actually a Plasti Band brand elastic band which uh, some folks on the list suggested as a possibility for belt replacement in these types of tape cartridges. Uh, I found it didn't work in this particular cartridge probably because the belt was a little bit too narrow so it wouldn't stay in place on the uh, the tapes on the tape reels or on the idler wheels or on the drive wheel. It would slip off and you can see right here that it's already slipping off the edge of the tape and trying to get stuck under this flange on the spool. So that was a failed experiment, but at least the red tape, the red band shows up better. So you can see what's going on here. The original belts were black. These transports also have a very common failure mode, but at least it's easy to fix. This rubber tire on the capstan, after 30 plus years, decomposes and then either turns to sticky goo or just crumbles away. I've already replaced this one uh, with a piece of latex tubing. It's the same type of tubing that's used in wrist rockets, just except it's black instead of yellow. It's very soft and uh, kind of grabby rubber. And uh, after cleaning off the goo from the aluminum hub of the, of the capstan, I cut this to length and just press it into place. It stays there by friction. I don't think it's going to require any glue to stay in place. And that was a fairly easy fix. So if I find any good TU-58 cartridges in my uh, collection, once I image them, at least I can repair these drives for use in machines like my VAX 11730. So even if you have good drive bands available for repairing the TU-58 cartridges, those bands are really difficult to install. I have a couple dozen of these cartridges that I want to try to image, and I'm wondering whether it might be better to uh, transplant their media into a different mechanism that dispenses with that drive band entirely. Now, ordinary audio cassette tapes also use 0.15 inch wide media, and there are cassette formats and thus matching read-write heads, with anywhere from one to eight tracks. Normal audio cassette drives move the tape past the head at one and seven eighths inches per second versus the 30 inches per second of a TU-58 drive. However, the audio cassette's physical format was used in data logging and streaming data applications with tape speeds up to 90 inches per second, both with and without the use of pinch roller type capstan drives. This is the tape transport from a TIAC MR30 data logger. I bought it on eBay for 10 bucks. 
The MR30 operated at tape speeds of up to 15 inches per second, recording seven tracks of analog data. Since the drive originally operated at half the tape speed of a TU-58 drive, I think it's promising that I may be able to either drive its motors faster or get suitable signals off the heads at the lower speed. So let's take a look at this transport. At first glance, this tape transport looks an awful lot like a regular audio cassette drive. There's a mechanical eject button down here, and an ordinary audio cassette tape will just drop right in, and then we can close it like that. The uh, front door comes off for maintenance purposes, just like on a lot of audio cassette drives, with a little spring latch here. That lets us see what's going on inside a little bit better. First unusual thing we notice here is that uh, this is a dual capstan drive. Most inexpensive and mid-range audio cassette uh, tape players use a single capstan right there and a single pinch roller to pull the tape through the uh, drive. This one has a dual capstan and dual pinch rollers so that the tape is both pulled on one side and pushed on the other side. Now the head is here in the middle you can see that there are seven twisted pairs coming off the bottom because this is a seven gap head for the seven tracks on there. I think this is an erase head and I don't know what this little guy over here does. Let's yeah. move around to the back side of the drive. This is a DC motor with an optical encoder mounted on the back. It's a really nice glass disc optical encoder that can be used for speed feedback to drive at the desired uh, speed. Looking at its output shaft in here, here's the output and it drives this clear belt which is tensioned by a spring-loaded arm with an idler wheel and then that belt drives the two capstans which moves the tape. Then it's a little bit hard to see but inside here there are a pair of DC motors, one there and one up there, that drive the take-up and uh, supply hubs. And then on the backs of each of those motors there's a magnetized disc that runs past a Hall effect sensor to sense the speed of the two hub motors. Over here there are a couple of large uh, solenoids. I think they have dual coils because you can see that when you push the core down it sticks in place. You can pop it back out of place like that. So I think these are probably dual core solenoids that uh, latch in either position. These two solenoids over here move these two arms which in turn one of them moves the capstan pinch rollers right there and the other one engages the head against the tape. So let's zoom in a little bit. I'll pull up on those two arms. First the rearmost one engages the pinch rollers and then the frontmost one moves the head into position. Then I can just push on the arms to pop them back out. So following the wires we can see that the various motors and solenoids are mostly attached to this board here which looks like it has uh, either diode steering logic or just some back EMF clamping diodes there and then has a connector for a ribbon cable up here to connect to the uh, driving circuitry that operates the motors and the solenoids. If we take out these two screws here the entire board hinges away for maintenance. can have a slightly better view of one of the uh, hub motors back here. Now the read-write heads are attached to this separate board down here in the bottom which we can see has a bunch of trimmer pots on the side and has its own big connector back here and there is a solenoid here that moves a large switch on the read-write board. Let's get this board off and take a look at it. Oh, 
Okay, so we can see this big switch here, which is solenoid actuated. And here's where the heads come in. There are a couple relays over here, a bunch of trim pots, and seven little hybrid circuits, which I bet are probably custom-made uh, preamps for the uh, read-write heads. This might be a read versus write switch. That would make sense. I don't know if any of this electronics will be useful for my application, or if I'll just connect directly to the heads with my own electronics. Or if I'll use a different tape transport entirely. But it's fun to take a look at this stuff anyway. So there's another solenoid up here, which when it's activated, moves a linkage that locks the eject mechanism, so you can't press the eject button. Then there's a micro switch up here, which gets actuated when you actually insert a tape into the drive. Then there's another micro switch right up here, which is, uh, which is actuated by the write protect tab on the cassette tape. There's also a little dash pod in here, which is linked to the cassette door and makes it open at a nice relaxed rate. So now I've unplugged the capstan motor and attached it to this benchtop power supply over here. Let's try spinning it. That should be driving the capstans. And yep, I can feel them spinning. They wouldn't show up on camera, otherwise I'd show them to you. Let's go ahead and engage the pinch rollers. That's the head. There they go. Let's take a look at the optical encoder inside of the capstan drive motor. Rear cover is held on by these two screws. Inside is a nice glass disc optical encoder. Let me see if I can zoom in on that and get some light behind it. There we go. This says TIAC. Those numbers there are just for reference. Uh, the actual encoder notches are in this area right in there. Looks almost transparent on the camera. Well, those uh, lines on the optical encoder wheel are too fine for us to uh, see on this camera. Oh, we can still see some nice detail of this very nice glass disc optical encoder with the DC motor inside of this aluminum housing over here. Yeah, motor porn. Here's one of the magnetic encoders in the back of one of the uh, hub drive motors. I'm just turning it by hand, it feels like there's an awful lot of friction in those two hub motors. I don't know if they need some oil in the bearings or if there's some type of brake mechanism. With this connector board hinged out of the way, we can get a better look at these dual coil solenoids which uh, engage the mechanism and latch in place. Now we can see the uh, three wires coming out of one of them, probably for two different coils to pop in both directions. Well, I'm going to have to do a lot more tracing of what's going on in this board in order to make any sense of this mess of wires that comes from the various solenoids and other motors into the back of the board. I have poked around a little bit with the power supply and managed to actuate one of the solenoids, but I have a feeling I'm going to find that these large electrolytic capacitors here are part of a capacitive discharge circuit where it would the original drive would charge up the capacitors and then use them to dump a bunch of charge into one of these large uh, solenoids in order to actuate the mechanisms. I've seen that same technique used in model railroad stuff when I was a kid to actuate the uh, electrically controlled track switches in a setup that, that I have. So that's it for now. When I get a chance I'm going to experiment with this drive and see what else I can learn with it, learn about it, and uh, I also have another streaming tape type drive, also made by TIAC, on the way from eBay. And that one, instead of using a capstan drive, it uh, has an optical encoder attached to a uh, roller that presses against the tape, and it drives the tape entirely from the spindles. I'm not sure whether it's a 30 inch per second or 90 inch per second model. Well, that's been my introduction to the 258 tapes, their tape transport, 
and some ideas for using alternate transports to try to image old tapes. Thanks for watching.